1 John. So join me at 1 John. We're going to be reading from 1 John in just a moment. You can get it on your devices. Uh, again, if you come in late, those who are uh, our off-site church joining us in the live stream, welcome this morning. Glad you can join us for our live stream. 1 John chapter 1, we're going to be going to chapter 1 in just a moment, not, not to be confused with the gospel of John, 1 John's right near the end, right before you get to that great book of the Revelation. A certain lady stood at the brass gates of heaven. The gatekeeper appeared and said, hello, we've been waiting for you. She said, this is such a wonderful place, how can I get in? The gatekeeper smiled and said, all you have to do is correctly spell one word. Well, what is it? She asked anxiously. Spell the word love. The woman smiled and spelled L-O-V-E, and she was welcomed into heaven. About a year later, that same woman was on gate duty when her husband unexpectedly arrived at the gate. She said, I'm surprised to see you. How have you been doing? He said, well, actually, I've been doing really well since you died. Do you remember that pretty nurse that took care of you? Well, we fell in love, married a few weeks after you died. Then I won the lottery and so sold our house, our little house, and moved to this big mansion. My new wife and I have been very happy, and we've been traveling all over the world. In fact, we were just on a skiing trip to the Swiss Alps when I got caught in an avalanche, and, well, that's why I'm here. So what do I have to do to get in? His ex-wife said, well, all you have to do is spell one word correctly, and you can enter heaven. He said, okay, what's the word? She smiled and said, Czechoslovakia. I want to try another word with you. Sin. S-I-N. But that middle letter is really the essence of the problem. It's the essence of when we've placed ourselves above God. And it breaks the first and the first four commandments where we have placed something else before Him and it's about us. John is writing first epistle here, chapter 1. Let's pick it up, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light and he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Note that part. If we Walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, the Son of God, purifies us from all sin. Verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Verse 9 is one of those great verses worth memorizing. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The topic today is the topic strengthened by honesty. And it's in the series that we're doing, Doing Life Together. Uh, again, if you're with us live, you can pick this up at the Info Center following the service. Uh, little booklets that we are going through. Uh, once a week on Wednesday, Women Wednesday morning, if you're available to come at 10 o'clock here for a study, that really follows up on what we've talked about on the Sunday. If not, on Sunday nights, or sun, not Sunday night, on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, you can go to our website, auroracornerstone.ca, and find, you can download a questionnaire, and we join live on Zoom at 7 o'clock. Strengthened by honesty. Someone wrote this, and, and this I thought was uh, a great little phrase regarding sin. Sin will take you further than you ever intended to stray, 
It will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay, and it will cost you more than you ever dreamed you would pay. Hmm. So when we get to the epistle of 1 John, it's written by John. John is the elder apostle. He wasn't the elder apostle when they were growing up. He was one of the younger ones, but he outlived them all. Not because they died of natural causes. All of the others died a martyr's death. John has actually, he's writing 1 John about 60 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So this is quite a bit after. This is one of the final books in the scriptures. It's actually 25 years after the Apostle Paul was killed in Rome by Nero. Wrong things had been happening in the church and John was feeling the weight of responsibility of having to try to help fix these problems in the church. And I've discovered that a lot of the things that were happening in the church back then is still happening in the church 2,000 years ago. We continue to struggle with a number of things. And specifically, sin. They were, they were uh, watering down sin that it really didn't matter. They were claiming they were people of righteousness and godliness, and yet they were living in sin. They were not living for the Lord. And John says, listen, you're deceiving yourself. You need to ask God regularly for forgiveness because we are prone to sin. And he began to talk, therefore, verse 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful. But you've got to confess. You can't just ignore them. And not just confess, meaning you just say it and then you go back to sinning. No, confess means you need to turn away. But he is faithful. He will forgive you. But you need to confess. And in the middle of that, he was drawing the importance of that we need to take sin seriously. I did a vlog, a number of vlogs, starting last July the 3rd. And uh, they're out there. They're available, those vlogs. And the, the series that I did... I went through almost three months' worth of these vlogs. They were little five, six-minute snippets. And these vlogs were entitled, 20 Reasons Why, 20 Reasons Why Not to Believe Sins Lie. That was the 20 Reasons Why. And so I was doing a reason, almost a reason a week. I'm just going to list these reasons. But these were 20 reasons I put down why not to believe sins lie. Sin does not satisfy. Sin leads to more sin. Sin leads to worse sin. Sin enslaves. Sin degrades. Sin humiliates. Sin steals your joy. Sin steals your confidence before God. Sin brings death. Sin hurts the Lord. Sin hurts the sinner and the sinner's family and friends. Sin brings reproach to the sinner, to the church, to the name of our Lord... Sin makes light the blood of Jesus. Sin puts the sinner on the side of the devil, sinner on the side of demons, and on the side of the world. Sin sets the sinner against God, the sinner against the church, the sinner against holiness, the sinner against life itself. Sin sets you against the very blessings and victory God has for you. Sin drains the anointing. Sin steals your time. Sin has eternal consequences, and sin will always find you out. 20 reasons why not to believe sins lie. Wow. I go back to these. I circle back because I just need these once in a while. Just I need to resist the temptations of sins lie. Because we're in a sin-saturated world that says, don't worry about this. But we do. God has made provision for these very things. And so today, I want to focus back on what was spoken here John, 1 John 1, 6, if we claim to have fellowship with him, that's your claim, and yet you walk in darkness, and yet sin is in your life, you lie. <laughs> he's, I guess this guy, he's, he's up in age, right? He's just like, he can't waste any time. He's just telling them the way it is. He's shooting straight. You're not living in the truth, he said, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, note this what he says, we have fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with one another. It didn't say, now I would have thought, 
you know, because he started off, if we claim to have fellowship with him, we walk in darkness, we're lying. But if we're walking in the light, then we have fellowship with him. That's what I would have thought it said. But he doesn't go there. He says we have actual fellowship with one another. He says your fellowship with one another is key to victory when it comes to overcoming sin. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim, verse 8, to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If, on the other hand, we confess our sins. Confess to who? We often think that we confess to God, and we do. But there comes a place where we need to hold each other accountable when it comes to sin. There's something about, it's easy for me to deceive myself when I live by myself. If I don't talk to anybody, if I don't bring somebody into my life and hold myself accountable, it's easy to be deceived. I just deceive myself. It's a bit harder if you've brought someone in on it. If someone knows you have a propensity in sinning in this area, and they know that, and you keep relationship with them, it's much harder to go back to sinning in that area, is it not? But if you refuse to bring them in, then you continue to, do, to deceive yourself and lie to yourself. He says, if you want to, have the, if you want to live this way, if you, if you want to live in the light... There's got to be the living in fellowship with one another so that you hold each other and there's an accountability because you'll do better by doing that. You'll be stronger by doing that. I'm going to lay out a number of things in a moment, but this is what he's talking about. But again, the, t- the title of our little session today is Strengthened by Honesty. Not just with God, but honesty with each other. So he says, if we claim to be without sin, verse 8, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. No man can confess. This is not about coming to a pastor or a priest or somebody and confessing your sins and they can cleanse you. Nobody can cleanse you of your sin. Only God himself can cleanse you. But you need people to help bring you to that place of confession. They will help bring you. So we can't claim to be in fellowship and still refuse to open our hearts to God and one another through true confession in faith. I don't think anyone here this morning will argue that we need to confess to God, but what about that in relationship to each other? Do, that, that, does that have to play with succeeding? Anybody remember the old series on TV, Gilligan's Island? Okay. Um. My goodness, there were reruns and reruns and reruns. My kids thought we loved it, and so they bought a bunch of DVDs for Lori and myself to watch. Um, you know, it, it, I watched so many reruns of it, I just I couldn't bring myself to watch it anymore. Maybe one day. But Gilligan's Island was a, a, a series that were back out back in the 70s, I'm going to guess. And it was a crew, seven people on the crew. They did a three-hour tour in the uh, South Pacific, and they got caught in a storm, and the storm took them to places they didn't want to go. They ended up being cast away on an island, seven of them. And there was Gilligan, the skipper too, uh, the millionaire and his wife, the movie star Marianne Professor. And the reason I can do that is because that's the song every time you watched it. It went through all seven of them. And there was a character on there, Gilligan, of course, Gilligan's Island. The character was a goofball, an absolute goofball. He did everything wrong. He tripped up everything. If anything could go wrong, it would go wrong. Gilligan would make it happen. And Gilligan got really hurt on this one episode. This one episode, his feelings got hurt, and he thought the rest would be better without him, and he would be better without them. And so he went to the other side of the island to live alone in a cave. And he was miserable in that cave, all alone. But he felt they didn't want him and he didn't need them. Now the others, there's six of them, and they got together and they were sitting down at a meal. And what were they doing sitting at the meal? They started talking about how much they missed Gilligan. Oh, they missed Gilligan. They missed his jokes. They missed missed his laughter, his gentleness. They missed all his screw-ups. And at a point in the episode, they began to think, you know, Gilligan must be so alone over there. So the skipper... He got up and he packed his luggage and he went off to the other side of the island so he could spend it with Gilligan. He was going to live with Gilligan in the cave. And one by one, they left their nice little, 
the little bamboo homes that they had at the lagoon, and they went to live in the cave with Gilligan. And here they all were living in the cave with Gilligan. Here, the point, that little, that little episode, we were never meant to live alone. We were never meant to do life alone. We were meant to do life together. We were meant to be in community. Last Wednesday in, on the Zoom that we had for doing life together, I asked a question. And the question was, tell of a time where you were a part of a group that meant a lot to you. And so different ones responded. Mission trip responded. Uh, response was in a small church group that was uh, very powerful. Another response was part of a club that was really important. And, and we began to talk about when we were part of a group that met regularly, that meant a lot. It might have even been a team. It might have been a sports team. It might have been a club that you did life together in that particular... And we, it really meant something. And so then this, the question followed up, has there been a time you've been a part of a group where it went bad? I mean, it dissolved. It just got... It, it turned inward and and was there a time? And why did it? And so we began to recount times when we were part of a group, maybe a small church, a church group. And frequently it was because of conflict. Frequently it was because of some personalities got involved or something. And then the people just quit going, got discouraged, got hurt, and quit going to group. And, you know, in looking back, many times we can see the work of Satan, the work of the enemy who got in there, stopping those groups because they had the potential to do great things. But wanting to bring division, wanting to bring conflict, and so the group stopped. And so here's what happens. If we're not careful, we stop doing groups. We stop connecting with people around the things of the gospel. We don't have small groups anymore. And so it's not, the Bible never made it so that it was enough to come once a week for an hour. It was meant so, yes, there was a teaching and a preaching and a time of worship. But then we go from there and we develop community so that we can use our giftings together and we can do exactly this. So that we can fellowship so that we do not fail into sin. My discovery is if you can isolate people, and I've you know, been pastoring a long time, and if you can isolate people, and I've listened to story after story of where people have failed, continue to fail, and you can frequently trace it back when they have been hurt, grew to bitterness, anger, and then they began to isolate themselves, and one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. The enemy wins. We're calling us we are strengthened by being honest in the place of what we're talking about doing life together. Uh, it, an interesting little episode is if you were to take a concordance, and a concordance is a Bible concordance where you look up a word. And so if you have a Bible concordance, if you had the word, for instance, if you had the word faith, it would show you every time the word faith is mentioned in the Bible. You can go to all those verses and read where faith is mentioned. Well, if you were to punch into the Bible concordance the word together and start at the book of Acts and go to the end of the book of Revelation, you would discover some pretty amazing things. I did that this past week, and I pulled out a few for your convenience, but this is a great little exercise. Here's were some of the ones I found. I looked at the word together, starting at the book of Acts, and here's what came of it. Meeting together, praying together, eating together, consulting with and advising one another, working together, standing together, assembled together, believed together, gathered together, rose up together, banded together, comforted together, planted together, labored together, helping together, knit together, living together. There's a whole pile of them. Those are good. You see the value, the strength of the early group of Christians was they knew how to do this together. Weaknesses when we don't. And we pull away. Jesus never meant for his followers to follow him in isolation. Wherever possible, there needs to be searching out and working together. So, let me just share three points. How fellowship and confession together help. The first word I want to use is the word fraternity. Everybody say fraternity. Now, when you say fraternity, often we think of colleges and universities, and it's usually not necessarily a good picture. 
But fraternity actually means feelings of friendship and mutual support between people. So one of the words, the depiction of fellowship and confessions together is a sense of fraternity, a feeling of friendship, mutual support between people. We've all laughed at the story, and I've used the story multiple times. You probably have heard it, of the two friends walking in the forest, and suddenly they stumbled upon a large grizzly bear. The grizzly looked at them and thought they would make a great snack. The grizzly started chasing them. The two were running for their life dependency. When one of them stopped and the other turned around and said, What are you stopping for? Don't you know the grizzly is hot behind us? His friend replied, I'm tying up my shoes so I can run faster. The friend started to laugh and says, Do you really think we can outrun that grizzly? Whereupon the one tying the shoes said, I don't have to outrun the grizzly. I only have to outrun you. Now, the story is funny if it weren't true too many times. If it weren't true that sometimes we are so competitive, the slowest or the weakest one, and loses. That's not what we're talking about. Fraternity means mutual winning. I don't win if we don't win. Hmm. I don't win if we don't win. We have to win together or no one wins. Fraternity. The benefits of doing life together is fraternity. Doing it together. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Now, iron sharpening iron, sparks fly. <laughs> you know, friendship takes work. Very seldom does it just naturally happen. Good friends frequently take work work, especially if they're friends over a period of time. I'm not talking about Facebook friends where we never really know the person very well. I'm talking about pre friends in person, friends that you literally do do life together. You talk about your hurts, your pains, your good, the bads. You even do trips together. Friends, those kind of friends, they take an investment. As iron sharpens iron, sharpening one another, so a friend sharpens a friend, and there will at times be sparks. The second word I want to bring here is felicity. Everybody say felicity. Felicity, word we don't use often, it means happiness. It better is translated contentment. Contentment. When there is this strengthened by honesty, this working together, one of the benefits is contentment. Acts chapter 2, verse 46, it says, Every day, this is the early church, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. You see this fellowship going on. Ate together with glad and sincere hearts. You see this, this ability for them to be able to find contentment to one another with glad and sincere. They were content. They were content. They worked together, worked ministry together, did life together. There was a contentment that rose between them. I have a picture here of Robert Reed. Robert Reed suffers from cerebral palsy. Robert has used this expression. He's, he's an author. He's written, here's what he says. I have everything I need for joy, and yet he suffers from cerebral palsy. His hands are twisted. His feet are useless. He can't bathe himself. He can't feed himself. He cannot brush his teeth. He cannot comb his hair. He can't even put on his underwear. Strips of Velcro often hold his shirts together, and his speech drags like a worn-out audio cassette. The disease keeps him from driving a car, riding a bike, and going for walks. But Robert Reed doesn't keep him from graduating from high school. It can't keep him from attending university from which he gradu graduated with a degree in Latin. He was fluent in Spanish. Having cerebral palsy didn't keep him from teaching at junior college or from venturing overseas on five missionary trips. Robert's disease did not prevent him from becoming a missionary in Portugal where in the first six years, he led over 70 people personally to the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. One of them was his wife, Rosa. Robert 
does not ask for sympathy. He does not want your pity. Just the opposite. He boasts in these seven words, I have everything I need for joy. And if it comes from him, we ought to listen. I have everything I need for joy. His shirts might be held together with Velcro, but his life is held together with joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Felicity, contentment together. The last one I want to mention is benefits of this is the word favor. It comes from Acts, 20, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Enjoying the favor of all the people. Favor. The word often is misused so many times today. But the favor here is linked to their fellowship. Because of their fellowship, they had favor with one another. Out of that came three fruits. Three blessings. Let me share the three blessings. We'll just close with these three. Here's the three blessings. Number one, they were encouraged. So what was the benefit of, of being strengthened by honesty and doing life together? Encouragement. Romans 1, 12. That you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Note what it says. Be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. When I listen to your stories, that's why I personally enjoy when I get emails of, and I, by the way, send <laughs> of what God is doing in your life. I'm blessed. You know, there's power in the testimony. There's power in the stories. It encourages me when I hear others share what God is doing in their life. And I want to share what God's doing in my life so that I might be an encouragement to you as well. The mutual encouragement, I want to read that text again. It's a great text, Romans 1.12 that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. If we don't get together, this doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Encouragement requires someone else. Ecclesiastes 4, 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. There you go. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. How can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three is not... the. And he begins to build on this. And four is even better. And five, you know, he begins to build on this. But he says there's a mutual togetherness for encouragement. When we fellowship with others, we actually are encouraged. We also are empowered. We're stronger. Romans 15.30 says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Paul's saying, listen, I depend on you. I am not strong if you're not praying. We've got to do this together. So pray for me. Join me in my struggle. And you would read through Paul's writings. There were times where he was weak and he says, where were you? Where were the prayer warriors? Where were those that those would come and visit me in prison? and would strengthen me, empower. You know, there's something about just being able to empower one another when we encourage each other and empower one another. And prayer is one of the great ones. Praying together. Last week I talked about don't only pray for someone, pray with them. If you're on the phone and you're saying, listen, I'm going to pray for you, I would like all of us to just tweak that. Instead of just saying, hey, hey, before we go, I'm just going to, I want you to know I'm going to be praying for you. Why don't you pray with them before you go? It doesn't have to be long. You don't have to pray for everything around the world and back again. Take a minute and pray with them. Let them hear you pray. There are a lot of people, and some of you are here today, who never get to hear someone pray for you. I know that. You don't get to hear someone pray for you. You might know somebody might be praying for you. And we as pastor and staff, we rotate through people in the church. We pray. But it's different if you actually can hear them pray for you. When somebody just stops and begins to lift you up before the Lord, praying for some of the things that they know are dear to you. 
It empowers you. You know, I've discovered that sometimes when we are in even groups and we are in that proverbial circle and maybe you're holding hands, not these days, or you're standing and go around the circle praying for each other, often we pray for our physical needs, things that we can see, touch, taste, all that stuff. I encourage to pray for the things you can't see, taste, touch, the things that are in the spirit realm. Pray for the things in the spirit realm. Pray that they would be more than victorious in Jesus. Pray that they would stand true against temptation this day. Pray that there would be a spirit of reconciliation. Whatever it is that you're praying into the spirit realm. And something I've discovered, we don't do this very well in Canada. I enjoy going to Cuba because they do this so well. And I know so many of our Latino areas and nations and countries uh, uh, and over in some of the Asian countries do this really well. It's like not just like being super polite and going around, but they just pray together together. They just lift up their voice together. It kind of sounds like chaos. But you can't deny the power. As they just begin to call on the name of the Lord together, and just one voice begins to rise up. And have you been in meetings like that? Oh, my goodness. You just lift your voice, and you hear others lifting their voice. They're calling on the name of the Lord, and you're praying, and you're, you're believing God to intervene and there's something just begins to generate in your spirit that there's an empowerment, we are agreeing together. When we read Acts chapter 2, when we see the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it's not coincidental that they were together in the upper room. It's not coincidental that it took a few days before they truly had a spirit of togetherness. And it says when they were in unity in spirit, oh, you cannot turn back what God wants to do. We're empowered when we pray together. We read Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The victory was praying together. Let me go to the last ones. We talked here of uh, where there is that ability, the fellowship of encouragement, empowerment. And I want to talk about how this works. It actually turns into work. I'm going to call it employment. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building, co-workers. We are able to work together, and we work stronger when we have some. You know, if I'm doing something, it seems to not be so hard to do it if I got somebody doing it with me. Uh, gardening, you know, if there's somebody working with you in the garden, it just helps. Uh, if you're, you're carrying stuff back and forth, if you have another person working with you, it just helps. You just are encouraged if somebody's working with you. Empowerment. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. We are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. We need each other. And we have to know we need each other. And when there's blessing and success, it's because of others too. It's not just me. Alex Haley, author of Roots. He has a picture of himself, and I, I, I have it here for you, hanging in his office. It's on his wall. It's a picture of a turtle. Do you see it? A turtle on top of a fence post. And many times he'll have that picture shown. When asked, why is that there? Alex Haley will answer, Every time I write something significant, every time I read my words and think, my words are wonderful, and I begin to feel proud about myself, I turn to this picture. I look at the turtle on top of the fence post, and I remember that he didn't get there on his own. He had help. I thought, that's a good word. He didn't get there on his own. However good you might be, however great I might think I am, he didn't get there. It was people. We did it together. We strengthened together in honesty. There's a quote that is reported to have been found in the home of an African preacher. It's entitled, This is My Church. He says this, here's the quote. It is composed of people. And you know, before I do, you know how often we, the, you know, 
we go from church and, you know, did I get anything out of church? Somebody say, hey, did you get anything out of church today? Was the church good today? And we often deflect it to others. I like, okay, now listen with those ears. Listen to this, uh, this African preacher. This is my church, he says. Here it is. It is composed of people just like me. It will be friendly if I am friendly. It will do a great work if I do a great work. It will make generous gifts to many causes if I am generous. It will bring others into fellowship if I bring them in. Its seats will be filled if I fill them. It will be a church of loyalty and love, of faith and service, if I, who make it what it is, am filled with loyalty, love, faith, and service. Therefore, with God's help, I dedicate myself to the task of being all these things I want my church to be. Hmm. Later on, I think it was from the same writing, he begins to make a bold declaration. He says, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, Smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, dwarfed goals. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. My guide is reliable. My mission is clear. I won't give up. Shut up. Let up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up for the cause of Jesus Christ. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till everyone knows, work till he stops me, and when he comes for his own, he will have no trouble recognizing me because my banner will have been made clear. Wow, that's a great aspiration. God, let it be. Let it be in me too. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that, Lord, we are not simply called to do this alone. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us the privilege of being a part of a great fellowship. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, men and women, Lord, I know that there are those here today watching that feel like I I don't have that and probably doomed that they never will. God, I pray that we just start stepping out one step at a time. And that, Lord, we would even do it during time of pandemic. doesn't mean we have to get together. There's other ways we can do it in the next few weeks. But, God, that we not simply put it off. That, Lord, you've called us. If we are to live walking in the light, not in the darkness then we recognize that we're, there's, there's a need for the body. So help us, Lord. I pray that you will lead us to others. You will help us to invest in that kind of lifestyle. God, it's so rewarding. The benefits are so rewarding that we would be encouraged. We would be empowered. We would, uh, our, we would work together. We would be employed to do the things that you've called us to do. And together, what fruit there is when we follow your mandate It's being part of your church, your followers. Grant that today, I pray, that we would be strengthened in you, we ask in your precious name. Amen. What I want to do before we go, we had learned a song earlier, and it was a new song for... Did anybody know the song? i just curious. Anybody here know the song, Hallowed Be Thy Name, before we did the song? My wife? Okay, the two of us. Okay, so it's a fairly new song. Can we sing that song one more time? I'm going to invite that that we um, put it back up on PowerPoint. Would you join me in standing?
you know if you are interested if you're interested in uh, these words because I know there's a lot of words I had I had one of my team members who was telling me that uh, they tried to memorize the words on this song and they just could not get all these names of God memorized if you are interested in the words of that I'll send it to you this week just send me an email we'll get it to you great words can we sing together one more time you know if you already done it once Hallowed be thy name, Jehovah God, you reign. You will never change, O oh Lord, forever you're the same. Do that one more time, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be thy name. Jehovah God, you reign. Yes, you do, Lord. You will never change, O oh Lord. Forever you're the same. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. You supply my every need. Jehovah Rapha, perfect health you give to me. Hallowed be thy name. Jehovah God, you reign. You will never change, O oh Lord. Forever you're the same. Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. You're the one who gives me peace. Jehovah Roe. My faithful shepherd leading me. Hallowed be thy name, Jehovah God, you reign. Let's worship him as we sing it. And you will never change, O oh Lord, forever you're the same. Jehovah Mekadesh, Jehovah Mekadesh, you're the one who makes me clean. Jehovah Sid Canoe. Jehovah Sid Canoe. Imparting righteousness to me. Thank you, Lord. Hallowed be thy name. Jehovah God, you reign. You will never change, O oh Lord. Forever you're the same, Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Nisi. Lord, you reign in victory. Jehovah Shama. You are always there for me. Hallowed be thy name, Jehovah God, you reign. You will never change, O oh Lord, forever you're the same. You will never change, and you will never change, O oh Lord. Forever you're the same. So, Father, that's the prayer. Holy is your name, O God. And that, Lord, you've called us into us, such a great fellowship. Lord, I pray that we would be quick to confess. We would be quick to be people of light, not walk in darkness. That, God, you would quicken that in our spirit today. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. Go in the strength of the Lord today.